Morning, everybody. Um, it's interesting, Emma mentioned uh, that wonderful, uh, beloved by Ian, certainly, um, Harvest song, uh, cauliflowers, fluffy and all that sort of stuff. Um, I was reminded this week, actually, of an experience, uh, you know, the school assembly. Um, for me, Gunnys Lake CP School down in Cornwall, whether it's sitting cross-legged or attempting to, um, or Mrs Mansfield was my reception teacher. Um, she got into trouble because she used to give us sugar lumps when we were kind of good and that sort of stuff, um, which you're not apparently meant to do. Um, but it worked. Um, or kind of Mrs Young, uh, Mrs Fricker uh, was my year five teacher, which is an unfortunate name really uh, to some extent. Uh, but she was great. And Mr McEwen. And the reason that I was reminded this week, though, of the school assemblies was of a song. Um, None of the songs that we might think this time of year would bring to mind, though. Uh, no, for me, it was that weapon-wielding one, If I Had a Hammer. Um, a song that, I mean, I heard the William Shatner's version uh, this week, which is not worth searching out at all. Because um, uh, it's interesting, though, that, uh, you know, we were never actually allowed to sing it at primary school, um, or certainly in the assemblies. The only times I think we maybe ever did was at the end of term, um, because everyone used to get so hyped um, about this idea of kind of having hammers and bells and all this sort of stuff, um, that it was just kind of outlawed, really. But I remember assemblies, and for me it was the Come and Praise hymn books, um, rifling through and that sort of thing. And I remember also, at the end of assemblies, we'd come to that time when we'd pray. Um, and you'd have to kind of, well, you'd, you'd sit up straight, you shut your eyes and put hands together. Those three actions. Uh, this sense that those three things meant that whatever words were going to come out were going to work, um, or whatever it is that we were thinking of uh, would come to be. Now, I know, and I'm sure uh, you know, that prayer is much more than just those three commands of sit up straight, uh, shut your eyes, uh, and put your hands together. But I was wondering whether such experiences maybe lead some people to think, well, is that all there is to it? Is prayer just something that we kind of do when we're told to as children um, uh, and has no real impact in life today? We begin a, a series this morning. It's going to take us through uh, to the end of November. Prayer, talking to God in today's world. In part, continuing our, our growing desire to say as a church, how is you know, our prayer life something that we are continuing to develop and grow and invest in? How is it part of our foundation in terms of who we are as a church? Um, and so we're going to be exploring it thematically, but very much coming from the Bible and saying, what does it say about prayer? Looking at different topics in terms of confession, lament, anger, reconciliation um, and others. Coming at it from you know, the different facets uh, that the Bible offers us in terms of what it means to engage uh, in prayer uh, with God. But the series also comes from this sense that, well, the world around us, the community that we're a part of, you know, they, they hear the idea of prayer banded about. And, you know, maybe, as I said, they kind of grow up sitting still uh, with their eyes closed um, and their hands maybe just poking the person next to them rather than together uh, in assemblies. And, you know, is there more to it? Back in February, uh, even the Sun newspaper uh, was encouraging its readers to pray. This was the headline um, it carried. Uh, pray for Tom, it said. Um, Britain united in prayer, the small print said last night, as fundraising hero Captain Tom Moore battled COVID in hospital. Um, what an interesting headline. Um, you know, and it just made me think, you know, obviously, you know, maybe they're trying to sell a paper here. Um, but what does it say to actually put across this idea that, that Britain is united in prayer? Uh, what does that mean for people to come together in prayer? According to research launched by Tear Fund, many in the UK returned to prayer uh, in the pandemic, with a third of UK adults uh, praying during the first lockdown period. Um, last May, the Telegraph uh, reported the coronavirus pandemic has resulted in a 50% surge in online searches for prayer. Now, I'm aware the arguments might be made uh, quite fairly, uh, but, but that was then, Ed. 
that was an experience that none of us had ever gone through quite like before we pray, never again. It was a moment. It was a pinch point. Um, you know, and, and if there is any kind of residual interest, well, it, surely it'll pass. Uh, people will turn back to the things that they were interested in and that sort of stuff. And as I say, you know, headlines are aimed just to sell papers. So they'll put whatever is going to capture people's attention. Or if there's kind of a, a national move or, or a moment uh, of emotion, then again, they're going to feed into that. Or perhaps there is an opportunity for us to explore this for ourselves, for you know, our neighbours, our friends, within the community that we're a part of. Not saying that we've got all the answers uh, and we have it all worked out, but we believe there is a lot more to it than simply sitting on a school floor, perhaps, um, up straight with your eyes closed and your hands together. Now today we're going to begin by looking at prayers of praise. Praise is that idea, you know, kind of well done, you've done a good job. Uh, it's, you know, an idea and a concept I'm sure is familiar to all of us. Uh, maybe because it's prompting memories for us when we were, we were praised and we received it and we did something and people recognised uh, what we'd accomplished. Perhaps it's bringing to mind thoughts where we, well, we wish we'd received praise. Or we did something that went unnoticed. You know, praise at a basic level is showing respect and gratitude. When it comes to prayer, I read this, uh, uh, praise and prayer, I read this as we, it corrects our perspective and reminds us who God is. It corrects our perspective and reminds us who God is. James Mays. Uh, the commentator, not the TV personality. Uh, He says, the movement into the presence of God is the first and most fundamental act that constitutes worship. And the 24-7 prayer website, uh, they powerfully state, God is worthy of all our praise. Before we have even voiced and request to him, he is good and has been good to us. And it's that challenge that even if I don't feel like it, you know, rejoicing in the Lord, offering him my worship, my praise, is the right thing to do. But we still might go kind of, but, but why is that? Is that surely just something that we're being told to do? Is there any real uh, depth to this? I want to read uh, a psalm. Uh, I invite you to, to turn your phone on and, and log in um, or open up to Psalm 100. As we just reflect on these few verses, as we explore this whole theme of prayers of praise this morning, Psalm 100. It reads, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. As I read that psalm, I... I don't know about you, but I picture a, a, a jubilant kind of carnival, joyous atmosphere. Uh, it was probably used uh, as they entered the temple courts. But it's this, talking about this opportunity to worship and to praise God. Something that we've freely been able to do uh, this morning as we heard uh, that story. For many around the world, that is not their reality uh, whatsoever. Now, psalm 100, for a relatively small psalm, uh, we've only got five verses here. Um, which if you compare it to the likes of Psalm 119, where you've got 176 verses, uh, be a slightly longer sermon. Um, but with only five verses, there's a whole load that is going on here. And in one respect, uh, you could describe it as a list of instructions that are being given here. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. 
the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Shout, worship, come, know, enter, give thanks, praise. As I say, there's a whole load uh, going on here. For me, though, as I've read this psalm through and and reflected on it and, and looked into it, for me, first and foremost, what we have here, though, is actually an invitation. It's an invitation to each one of us. Now, I'm sure we've all received countless invitations in our lives. Um, we might have received you know, for a whole host of different things, whether kind of birthday parties, uh, anniversaries, you know, retirement dues, uh, corporate events, um, and many other things I'm sure that you'll probably come and tell me about afterwards. Um, of the invites that you received, maybe some really wild and wacky ones, uh, maybe some that you really wished you hadn't responded to because they were dull as ditch water. I remember growing up, uh, going to my granny and granddad's house, though, and I saw a photo, I can picture it now, uh, it was at the top of their stairs, I think, on, a, on the wall, um, a photo of them meeting the Queen. And not just one of those photos where they kind of stood outside Buckingham Palace and kind of said, yeah, we saw the Queen, um, or in a mass gathering of people. But no, it's actually uh, it my granny, my granddad, and the Queen, and they're actually kind of doing a whole conversation, kind of whether they shook hands, I don't know, um, but talking to each other. Now, I'm pretty sure, I didn't ask this ever to be certain, but I'm pretty sure they didn't just decide one day to rock up at Buckingham Palace. Um, And kind of, of, well, we're in the neighbourhood, let's see if Liz is in, shall we? Um, Or we've got some time to kill, that sort of thing. No, they'll have been invited. They'll have received in the post probably a very nice invite, Um, probably quite a fancy one. Um, uh, and it's because of that that they would have attended on that particular day and they would have been able to meet the Queen. And that photo that I uh, grew up seeing was subsequently taken. Now you see, Psalm 100 is an invite to all of us. It's broken down, you can see, into kind of two parts, each one consisting of an invite to praise God followed by the the rationale, the reason as to why uh, we should be doing it. Firstly, uh, verses kind of one to three, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs, know that the Lord is God. And we want to say, why? It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And then verse four, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. Again, Why? For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. See, Psalm 100 is an invite. It's an invitation to the whole earth to know, to worship and to praise God. It's that that possibility. it's, It's that opportunity that is before every single One of us. Yesterday I was reading um, a book by a guy called Rick McKinley, uh, Jesus in the Margins. And uh, he echoes uh, kind of some of what Psalm 100 is talking about, but also kind of points out some of the challenge that I think we face. He says, you know, our culture tells us to create our own meaning. Our culture teaches that you are the most important person in your universe. So find your own meaning. Now McKinley goes on to point out, though, uh, that that is not how we find true meaning. Our culture may tell us, yeah, you know, you you try and uh, feed yourself with whatever you can get. But actually, as we're reminded in Psalm 100 uh, and others, it's the knowing, it's the following, and it's the praising of the one who created us, who created this world, and who longs to know us. That is when we find true meaning, true fulfillment and life that will never end, however much this earthly world will pass away. And it's acknowledging this perspective, if you will, when we come to prayer, uh, recognizing that, that praise is not just some optional extra. It's not just something for those people who have eaten too many blue Smarties um, and are really excited Um, or play drums very loudly, or whatever it is. You know, when it comes to prayer, praise 
is a key and an integral part of it. Now, however much we might come and we might be in need, or we might be coming and asking, you know, for others in prayer, um, you know, our intentions might be quite rightly looking to, to other situations and those around us. First and foremost, we need to come in that attitude of praise, recognizing who God is, all he has done, all he continues to do, the impact that he makes, the creator that he is of all things, and the reality that that will never change. You know, praise, it's the, the first step I came across in terms of our interaction with God. And if we ask that question, what does it look like, therefore? How might this kind of be shaped in terms of our lives? In his book, How to Pray, Pete Gregg uses the phrase, I love this, he says, worshipping with your own weirdness. And what he kind of is talking about is, in many ways, saying that we're all weird. Um, We all do things differently. Um, There is no one set way, uh, no one fixed pattern, uh, no one kind of set of points that you've got to work through to make it uh, come to be. No, prayer is about that interaction, that engagement, that communication, that relationship with God. And as we bring our praise to him, in the same way, it's actually recognizing that it's that two-way thing between us and him. And just because I praise God in a certain way doesn't mean that you've got to do that. What's important is that praise is part of our prayer life. You know, we might praise God with our voices, uh, using words. We might do it loudly, we might do it softly. Uh, We might do it collectively, like we, we do when we gather on a Sunday, but we might do it personally, by ourselves, maybe when there is no one else around. Again, as we've... uh, Shared this morning, it might be uh, through making music, playing instruments, uh, again, sharing with others. You might do it uh, through writing or drawing. Could be being creative um, with clay or textiles or, or some other kind of medium. For some of us, praise might be using our bodies. We might raise our, our hands in, in adoration to God. Might be bowing down physically on the floor as we come and we recognize just how awesome God is. We might witness creation with our eyes as we go about our days or as we go on a walk um, or a ride or whatever and and again are just stopped and struck by the awesomeness of God. We might use words that others have penned uh, over many, many years. We might take the Bible Uh, as I said last week, the greatest toolbox we've ever got um, as believers and use the words such as Psalm 100 uh, as we come and we praise God. (laughs) With all of this though, it's about that conscious choice that I need to make, that you need to make, that we uh, as believers, if we're following Jesus, need to make. You know, when I get up in the morning and I go downstairs... Um, before anyone else has got up, um, before the kind of the routine in the Jones household of waking various children and getting breakfast ready and lunches and all those sorts of things, I have that choice. I can either, well, I can log on to, to Facebook, I can log on to my emails, um, I can look at the news and kind of think, well, that's me being spiritual because I'm just seeing what's going on in the world, but really I just want to know what's going on in the world. Um, or I can start my day and actually go, God, I want to praise you. Now that may be, that I might read one verse of a psalm. I might spend half an hour um, reading verses. I might just sit there in silence. I might listen to music. There's no fixed way, but it's that choice that I need to make to come and to praise God. And praise Him because of who He is. It was Nancy Maris who said this. She said, Who one believes God to be is most accurately revealed, not in any credo, but in the way one speaks to God when no one else is listening. I'd want to take it one stage further uh, and this morning say, who one believes God to be is most accurately revealed, not in any credo, but in the way one brings praise to God when no one else is listening.
Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for that privilege of being able to draw close to you and to worship you. To lift your name up. I want to thank you again for the the wealth that that we have before us in your word. Uh, Such a great starting point if we don't know where to begin. But I thank you that you as the greatest and most creative artist ever, you make each of us unique. Help us to respond to you, to bring our praise to you in and out of seasons, through all things, through the ups and the downs of life, remembering that you are faithful, that you are there through it all, and that you are worthy of all our praise. Amen.